Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Ralph, and I'm an alcoholic. And I would, uh, I'm going to do what the rest of the speakers have done. Not because the rest of the speakers have done it, but because it's, uh, it's heartfelt. Mark and Dawn, but Mark, you had a vision. And more important than having a vision, had the commitment and, and the balls to stick with that commitment. <laughs> That's more than a notion to put something on in New York. Uh, you guys sometimes out here pay a lot for a little, you know. It's um, it's challenging. It's, uh, you know, many people in here know what it is to be involved in putting on anything in Alcoholics Anonymous and to do the work. And a lot of times it feels like the thank yous are, why did you do it like this? Why didn't you do this? Why can you, you know, and, uh, but on behalf of at least this table up here, and I'm going to speak probably for most of the people who've been here, Mark, this has been a hell of a weekend, you know. Uh, so I'm reminded in Alcoholics Anonymous of what it is that that we get the opportunity to do unity recovery and service you know and the and the speakers who've been up here you know we've been doing the spotlight work in Alcoholics Anonymous I always talk about that that's a spotlight work all eyes on us we get to come up here you guys do a long line and you thank us and you tell us oh you appreciate us traveling and the rest of that and the end you that's cool that's that's the spotlight work uh, and it's rewarding you know, I came in here, my sponsor's here this weekend, and he says his gift is he fell in love with alcoholics. And I, that's me. Fell in love with the program. When, when I came to stay, it wasn't hard for me to get into the fellowship, the unity part of our program. Fell in love with it. And as a result of doing that and doing that and doing that and doing that and doing that, I'm from a region in this country where we talk about the big book from the day I came here. We've always talked about recovery, and I'm the kind of guy, why be in a 12-step program and not know about the 12 steps? It don't make sense to me. You know, what I do, I do. You know, sports, I'm a sports fanatic. I collected baseball cards. I could tell you one year, you know, Elgin Baylor in the playoffs, average 30, and he averaged these men. You know, I could, I, I, you know, I subscribe to High Times. Whatever it is I do, you know, I... <laughs> I get into, I get into my craft, you know, so as a result of coming around here long enough, I said, why be in a 12-step program and not know about the 12 step? God ain't really interested in that. And so God then started getting into the recovery part of this. And so as a result of getting into the recovery part and having had a spiritual awakening as a result of that, you know, what do you do with a woke up spirit? And put it in the service. And that's the deal. That's the people around here who know the secret to what it is that we do. You know, those are the people, guys like Tom, you know, I, I still don't take it for granted. Blows me away. Dude got up. He didn't know me. Got up, got in the car, came to the airport, picked me up, took time out of his day, you know. And that's the people, the guys that's been at the back in the yellowish, greenish garb. I appreciate you guys, the greeters, you know, the security. You know, the ladies who sat at the registration table. You know, the people who sold the lottery, the, the, the raffle tickets, you know. The, you know I, I call them the shadow soldiers, the ones who work in the back, the ones who get up on a Friday night or a Saturday night and they get out of their warm beds and they get out from in front of the TVs and they go fire up the coffee pot and they open up the door and they wait for Ralph White to show up. Super Bowl Sunday, seventh game of the World Series, NBA Finals, get out of their bed, fire up the coffee pot, wait for Ralph White to show up. They go in our jails, they go in our institutions, they go in our treatment facilities, and they look for Ralph White. 
And I am so grateful to the men and women, the shadow soldiers, the ones who work in the back, who kept the light on for a drunk like me. Still great. Still great. Feel overwhelmed when I get the opportunity to sit with the men and women who've been here this weekend. You know, we, we, to what we do and what we've been doing this weekend is try to put, give words to something that you can't really give words to. So we do the best we can to describe a personal experience. When I talk to you this morning and I speak of this God of my understanding, trust me, whatever it is that I say is very limited because I'm trying to give words to something for which there are no words. When we talk to you about our experience in Alcoholics Anonymous, at least for this God, I try to give words and I try to breathe life into something that you, you guys in here know what it is. I have a friend who says you can't describe the taste of a banana. You got to experience it, and it's an experience for each and every one of us. You know, and I've never been the anchor man. You know, I'm usually at the front end. So as the anchor man in this kind of deal, I, you know, I'm already on full. You know, I was, I was in sales for a time, and one of the tenants of selling is, Know when to quit. Know when to quit, you know. And so I really want to just say ditto to everybody else and just, I'm out, you know. Um, but you gave me the time, so I, I'll take it, you know. Um, my boy started us off. Carl, he and I have been together so many times this year, and he's from home. And he kicked this thing off, and he set the bar where it needed to be set. Then Mr. Lorenz here from uh, Indy. Mike said some things that spoke directly to me. You know, I'm a guy, uh, I'm a guy that says some stuff and, you know, the, but it, it's a trip because the longer you do this deal, the less invested you are in the way you think this deal is supposed to be done. I used to have really strong ideas about it. When I do inventory, I don't put myself on the list. I'm not going to write about it. That's another way of being self-centered. Here you go. Yeah, you want to write. Yeah. And But Mike says some things that has nothing to do with, you know, oh, the structure is just laid out near. It has to do with, do you want to see yourself? Do you want to do whatever it is, you know, that is going to enhance whatever it is that helps you with this whole self-examination? You just opened me up to some, some new ideas about some things, you know, and I really appreciated that, you know. Peter, Peter had to take off already. You know, I love Peter. And Peter brought more spirit. Peter is an intense guy, you know. But, you know, with his intensity, he has some enthusiasm. You know, I love Peter Marinelli, you know, and he's got that intensity. But that's up here. When you meet him off of here, you know, Peter's like a gentle guy and the rest of it. So, uh, talking about no words, if you guys were not here, you don't describe the diva of the crew. <laughs> the lovely Katie Parker and Katie. Oh, man. You know, Katie said some stuff. Here's the deal. And I, you know, you guys are saying, did this dude get up here to summarize the weekend? Well, I got up here to talk about got up here to talk about my experience and my experience with this deal. I always get a fresh experience. Katie says some things and it, and it dawned on me and you know, and I don't mean to talk about it, but what Katie says, sometimes the danger when you put a label on just, is the hearer hears something that you didn't intend because Katie talked about, I'm a technician. And when I was listening to Katie, I'm like, no, you're not because Katie's like, write on a napkin if you have to, you know, just get it done. Just do the damn thing. Just get in touch with the power. Don't worry about how it looks in the perfection of it. Just get in touch with the po And Katie has an insight and a way of communicating that just, it's intimidating because it's like, because I do four and five, and I'm like, man, I'm not Katie, you know. And uh, then my sponsor. If for no other reason, Mark, I want to thank you for getting me here on the same weekend. No. I think I had a best sponsor in Alcoholics Anonymous, and if you don't think you had a best sponsor in Alcoholics Anonymous, well, 
maybe get a, but no, nah, don't, don't trip off that because this ain't a comparison thing. He's the best sponsor for me. He's the best sponsor for me. He may not even be for you. Don't trip off that. But he's the best sponsor for me. And if you listen to him do six and seven, you get a glimpse of why. Uh, sponsorship, I'm going to talk about that a little bit if I get through talking about the speakers. You know, um, <laughs> Sponsorship is not a one-size-fits-all. It's tailor-made. It's customized, you know. And the sponsorship relationship, as far as, as I am concerned, uh, yeah, take people through, show them the words, but there is something that will fill in a lot of the gaps. And my sponsor in addition to being a man who walks this thing. And I keep learning more about him because he won't tell me. And when Gary Brown was standing up here sharing about his relationship with him, I said, yeah, that's my sponsor. That's the way he rolls. That's the way he does. He fill in the gap. He steps in and he mans up. And he mans up when I came man up. So that's, that's what he does. Um, and I'm grateful for that relationship. No, I never met Gary Brown in person, but he's impacted my life in a big way. There are some guys who've been doing this deal in a particular way, and the way that I do what it is that we do comes from those guys. And I've heard a lot about him, and he, you know, when, when, when Bill saw Ebby at the front door, and he said he shouted great tidings. He, you know, he talked about his deportment as a walking uh, alcoholic. Son. And the thing about Gary that makes it easy is he talked about struggling. And he's, I think, you know, folk talk about we don't have icons. We don't put people on pedestals. And Alcoholics Anonymous, I came in here broke, beat down, toe up. I needed somebody on a pedestal because the people I had on pedestals in the life, I needed to replace them with something. And they weren't on pedestals, but they were, they were places I wanted to go. They were markers for me. You know, they were markers. You know, that's like when, you, when you're on the freeway and three miles down the road, you know, this is where you're trying to get to. These men were markers and these women, you know. And so, yeah, you know, some of them, for me, it was good. I told you I grew up sports heroes, have heroes in Alcoholics Anonymous. A lot of them are sitting in this room right now, you know, and that's one of the guys, you know, I've been hearing a lot about walking example. My boy, Steve Lee. Wow. When Steve talks, you'd be like, I don't want to talk now. You know? I don't, don't want to talk. I don't want to talk. Steve is a wordsmith. You know, he's kind of like, you know, I said about Bob Darrell and Steve Lee, it's kind of like that poet laureate of alcoholics. And I, Steve just weaves it. And, I, and, and more than that, more than that, the thing I'm, I'm saying about all the speakers up here, more than them talking up here, I know them all. I know them. And they live this thing. It's a trip. When you bring some people out, it's one thing when you get people who can articulate what the process is and talk about it. It's another when you get people out who can articulate it. But more than that, they live it. They live it. You know, so you can take my word for it. You know, they these people live it. Me and Charlie Parker stayed up. I almost shut the place down. I like being a shut the place down kind of guy. <laughs> I'm one of the ones that used to shut it down and then go look for the after hours because the party ain't never over for me. You know, I come from South Central Los Angeles. I have a big family, you know, and, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a high achiever, you know, and coming up in life, I, I always had some things and, and not had some things. I never had material things, but I had dreams and goals and hopes and aspirations. You know, I, I, you know, in Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the common themes you hear from most of our members is they never felt like they fit in. That's never been a part of my story. I've never been interested in fitting in. I've always wanted to stand out. And as a result of that, I achieved and I accomplished some things coming up in life. And some of the reasons I was a high achiever, you know, uh, is, is, is you've heard it from so many speakers in here, you know, is that, that, that prison I've lived in much of my life. I'm trapped in what I think you think about me. And I want to shape and mold and form and frame your opinions about Ralph White, you know, and I, and I'm deathly afraid that if you really know me, you won't like me. 
you know, and that has been a driving force in my life for many years. Took a long time before I took my first drink. You know, I was 16 years old. Somebody talked about 12 years. I was 16 years old, and that's very late in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I was busy on my way to being the first black president of the United States, you know. <laughs> People laughing here, but in my neighborhood, I grew up in the heart of Watts. I'm from the 60s. I was in, I, I lived across the street from where the Watts riots took place. I mean, where the National Guard set up. Grew up in that time, but I grew up in a time and in an era when I was going to make a difference in my community. I was going to make a difference in my neighborhood. I was going to make a difference in this world. People in my neighborhood, when I was growing up, and I would say I want to be the first black president, you know, people would pat me on the head and say, you go for it, because I was always student body president, class president, straight A student, teachers, pet grew up going to school. My mother, old Southern Baptist sister, and she used to take her six boys to church every Sunday. I'd resent it. I said, as soon as I turn 16 years old, you won't have to worry about Ralph White darkening the doors of anybody else's church. Said it, did it, meant it. Religion was an opiate of the people. Rather smoke mine, thank you very much. You know, and, and that's the kind of stuff we would say that was real cute back then in the city. But that, that's the way I'm rolling, man. And, and my grandfather, you know, he was a deacon at church and he was one of the founders and everybody liked him. He had probably fifth or sixth grade education. Old Southern cat that came to Southern California to make a better way for his family, you know, and, uh, and, and homeowner, same, you know, and I look at my grandfather and my granddad and my mom up in church and I'm like, yeah, that's cool for you guys. You from the South, you little, you need some people to tell you how to think and to tell you how to live. I'm too slick for this. You know, I'm the new generation. I'm not trying to do that. You know, when I hit the chapter after we agnostics, you know, there were some things in there about forming this relationship with this power that were very important for a guy like me. And it said, be quick to see where religious people were right. They were, they were exhibiting a degree of stability, usefulness, and happiness. Stability, usefulness, and happiness. LO63992. LO, that's a prefix. Youngsters, phone numbers used to have letter prefixes. You know, that's my grandparents' phone number. I can't tell you how many phone numbers I've had in my life. My grandparents had one phone number the entire time they lived while I was alive. The exhibiting a degree of stability. You know, and I used to talk about my granddaddy don't make as much in his lifetime as I'll make in a year or two years because I was, I was working in good, you know, and, and it dawned on me when I hit chapter we agnostics, as much as I talked about the, as much money as I made, not what little granddaddy made, it dawned on me. Granddaddy never asked me for bail money. Smart guy, you know. And so I'm out. And so that chapter, you know, opens some stuff up for me. You know what? I'll, I'll probably dance around and get around, but I really want to talk about what it is I'm charged with this morning. You know, our 12th step, you know, uh, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to. Uh, practice these, you know, carry this message to alcoholics and practice these principles and all our affairs. And, and so I get here, but you need to know one of the reasons why we share our stories is because you can't appreciate where I am if you don't know where I come from. For all you know, this thing come easy for me. Yeah, dude, you standing up there in a suit and you've been doing this for 27 years. Yeah, of course you can talk about God. It come easy for you. Look at you. You square. You a schoolboy. The rest of the well, What? We do a disservice a lot of times when we talk about everybody know how to drink. Carl talked about it. We look very different in the life. And the thing that the power in Alcoholics Anonymous. The power in Alcoholics Anonymous is not the transfer of information. The power in Alcoholics Anonymous is to see the transformation. Get the information, new people that are sitting in here right now. You came for a weekend and you think you're going to get filled with these speakers, these powerful speakers in Alcoholics Anonymous who are going to arm me with some new information. Forget the information. It's about the transformation. It's about the transformation. The guy you see in front of you this morning is not the guy that came to you October the 11th, 1986. Something happened. Something happened. And as much as I respect the distinguished crew right here, and I really want to, you know, sometimes I have to not think about them because I think, oh, God, people critique, and that ain't the way they do it. Flora, I came to talk to you. I came to talk to you. Yeah, you. 
One day so. I came here for you. Because we all been there. I love when Bill said, we know what you're thinking. I'm jittery alone and I'm alone. I can't do this, but you can. But you can. Good news, bad news. Sometimes in Alcoholics Anonymous, the first thing we say to a newcomer, it's going to be all right. I want to let you know it ain't going to be all right. (laughs) Keep going the way that you want. It ain't going to be all right. And it's that collapse. I love when my sponsor talks about that. It's on that collapse. Bill said how dark it is before the dawn. It's on that collapse. It don't take a lot of courage, and it does take some courage, but I don't pray you courage. I pray you desperation. My life had got to a real dark place October 1986. I'm not the man who's standing in front of you this morning. That's not who it was that came to you guys. I have six brothers, five brothers. All six of us were in the life together. We damn near killed my mom. Three of my brothers were the first three guys off my block to go to college. Me, then my brother Ron, then my brother Ratch. I'd be student body president, then Ronnie, then Ratch. Went off to school, made my mom proud, written up in the paper. You know, my mother was always, you know, PTA, all these things. Everybody in the neighborhood knew us. Some few years later, fast forward, everybody in the neighborhood knew us again because neighborhood watch was like, get their asses off the block, you know. And they, and so that October 1986, when I found you guys, I lost my home. I lost my marriage. I wrecked it. I'd done most of the things that most of us do by the time we reach a place like this. I was walking the streets at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning with nowhere to go. I turned into one of those foot soldiers. I was sleeping in the back of my mother's garage, and I was eating lemons off a neighbor's lemon tree for, for breakfast. I'm a graduate of a major university in this country, and my job at the end was taking the trash out for a 21-year-old. I hadn't answered anybody's 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock wake-up call to go to work in so long, I no longer knew if I was employed. Didn't know where my little girl was going to school. Didn't know where my family was living. Met you guys in that condition. You know, tore up. And I came in here, and I found my people. And I started going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got into the Unity part of that program. And I fell in love with the fellowship, like I said, before I fell in love with the program. And after about a year of going to meetings and diligently going to step studies at the hall and listening to people share about steps that they hadn't worked, but it's good, including me, even if, by the way, you know, I, I love talking about stuff I don't know about. <laughs> What? I ain't no problem, you know, and uh, I get in an argument like that too, you know. And if, 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 you know, if you can't be smart, be loud. You know, that's my thing, be loud. You know, you know so anyway, I'm doing the deal, I'm doing it, and I'm sitting at a marathon meeting, and some men and women came in at a slot. And they were a group called Big Book by the Sea in, in Santa Monica. And they presented the Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous in a way I had never heard. In a half, an hour and a half meeting, they had members proceed to come up, and each one of them would share about it. And I was like, wow, what is this? You know, and I asked my mom, and my brother and I, you know, because in Alcoholics Anonymous, as important as it was for me to get a sponsor, I found another couple of things important. You won't find it in the big book. You won't find this in any of our sponsorship pamphlets. You won't find this anywhere except in Ralph's book of experience and a lot of your book of experience. As important as it was for me to have a sponsor, I had a couple of road dogs. And my road dogs early on, because this is going to have to be fun for me. Floor, if it wasn't fun, I wouldn't be doing it. You'd have, they'd have another person doing the 12 step. You know, this was fun for me. And my brother and my boy, Strange, we were, we were hitting it. 
We were doing the damn thing, man, and we fell in love with it. We had one car. Strange had an old yellow bucket, and whoever had a panel that night could use the car. And we would be rolling. We'd go to meetings. We'd take meetings to members who, were, who couldn't get out to meetings. And we started doing the damn thing. And my brother and Strange, we were all at this marathon together. We said, we want this. And we approached two of the members in that group. And my brother and I approached my mom. We were both staying at my mom's house. Years old. I said, Mom, can we open the doors? And in November of 1987, we opened the doors to my mom's house. And about 12 people sat around a dining room table, and we had these blue books open. And we started going through that book page by page, line by line. And that was November of 1987. And in Los Angeles, it's probably about 6 in the morning right now, but in about three hours, you know, that workshop that started then, we would finish the 12th step, we'd take a month off, then we'd open up for a new crew of people. Most of the same people came back, and a new batch came back. We had about 12. We liked it. We said, let's do it again. Some people said they liked it. And that was our intention to just go through the book a couple of times. And, well, since November of 87, we outgrew my mom's house. We went to a hall. I grew it. And so in about three hours at home in L.A., it'll be about 250 to 300 members sitting in a meeting, the Never Too Early Big Book Workshop, going through that book, page by page, line by line, doing what it is that we do better than anybody else. Floor. A group of us went out the other day, and we went to 182 Clinton, you know, Bill Wilson's old address. And some years back, in the 30s, December 1934, that gentleman found himself in the hospital. Fourth time, same hospital. Went up in that hospital, and something happened in the hospital. The doctor had told his wife, get a black dress, because do get ready for his funeral. Or he going to the nut house, the way he going, because he get lo- he, he do it like I did it, you know. And told his wife to get ready. Something happened to him in the hospital that December in 1934, and it was so profound. And, and he had been in there a few times. But whatever it was that happened scared him. And he told the doctor, doctor, and described to him what happened. He said, am I going crazy? And the doctor said, from the outside looking in, this is how profound that experience was. The doctor looked at him and said, dude, whatever it is, I don't know, but you wouldn't look good holding on to it. And he left the hospital, and he went out looking for people like you and me. Six months passed, couldn't find nobody, preaching to him. You need to do, you need to have this white light experience. You know, nothing happened, but he stayed sober. And in that length of time, some of, his, some of his guys that he used to do business with put together a business opportunity. They said, we want you to represent us in this business deal. Sent him out of town to Akron, Ohio. And his business didn't come off too well. And he found himself in a hotel lobby on a Saturday afternoon, and he got thirsty. He got thirsty. And he could see the bar from the hotel lobby, probably hear the ice clinking in the glasses. I always think when I, because I put a backstory on the story. You know how it is when you're trying to get sober, and you, when you first try to get sober, you kind of be like a kid, like Santa Claus. I'm doing the right things. If Ralph do good, good things will happen, right? But in the back of your mind, you're thinking, this thing ain't going to work. If it had been me and my business had fell through, I'd have been like, I knew it. I knew it. Why did I even get my hopes up? Because if his business had gone through, he'd have been set. And trust me, him and his old lady needed to be set because they were struggling. They were struggling. With a good motive, he'd have been set. He was tired of his wife struggling like that. He was tired of being a burden every day. He was tired of it. And his business didn't come off too well. And he stood in that lobby. And he could see, and he didn't have the money. Barely enough money to pay for his room. Get a drink, try to pay for his room. Get a drink. And he remembered his buddy that he had seen and told him, you're going to need to work with somebody. My sponsor talks about Bill Wilson always said yes to Alcoholics Anonymous. And the first time he, the thought came in his mind, I need to find a drug not to drink. Our first turning point as a society, we stood at the turning point in the personification of Bill Wilson. And he said, yes, to the idea of finding a drunk. That's still what it is that we do. That's what we do. He didn't have 12 steps. 
He didn't have a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. He didn't have a fellowship. He didn't have a sponsor. He didn't have prayer at that time, even though that was a prayer. A plea is a prayer, whether you frame it or not. I need to find a drunk to work with. And what he had that is so instructive, what he had and what he did was found a drunk to work with. Through a series of divine coincidences, he was making calls and he got put in touch with a lady who had a husband that was one of us. Ms. Smith, I understand you got a husband who's got a drinking problem. I'd like to come talk to him. Do right now today. It's inconvenient. He'll give you 15 minutes tomorrow. That 15 minutes turned into about four and a half hours. And those two gentlemen set about looking for people like me and you. What it is we doing out for us and not. Practical experience. And that was our first practical experience in the person of Bill Wilson for all of us. Practical experience shows that nothing ensures immunity from drinking as much as intensive work with another alcoholic. That's what it is that we do. The rest of it is the trappings. The rest of it is to facilitate that. We do that. If nothing ensures immunity from drinking like that, check this out. Immunity, that's a key word that's in that sentence. So if I'm going to get immunity from drinking, that's my immune system working with others. If your ass ain't working with others, you're walking around with spiritual aids. <laughs> if I'm not working with others, where is my immune system? That's what it is we do. And that's what it is we came to talk to you about. And that's the good news. When it talks about, you know, to carry this message, and then a lot of times people get caught up on the, this message and that's, you know, yeah, this message, but what is this message? Sometimes people think this message is the method. That ain't the message. The message is I've done these things that have put me in touch with a power that has given me access to a power. Because that's, that's the whole deal. This isn't a series of, of steps that we get graded on. It's not a series of discrete steps that you say, Ralph, where are you at? It's a series of integrated activities that if I put them together as a whole, it's the way I live my life. It's the way I live, and it's an integrated set of actions that become a working part of who it is I am, and I can't tell you the day or the time or the hour when that thing happened for me. This attitude that Steve talked about, this attitude had been just given to me. I can't tell you when it happened. I can tell you that I know it did happen, and it was a looking back experience where, damn, I'm not thirsty, and I don't even think about it. Damn, I'm sitting in here at a bar because I'm here for a good reason, or I'm at a wedding, and they're drinking alcohol. It's just like they're drinking water. I can't tell you when that happened. I can tell you that it did happen as a result of a series of discrete activities that I started incorporating into my life as a way of living. You know, I'm a guy that, um, you know, my sponsor, and he's here, and I, you know, I, I just take stuff from him, he's here, and that's what he says. He says, you can't treat a spiritual condition through mechanical means. We do the mechanics, but that's not what's treating it. We do the mechanics to get in touch with the power. The power is what's doing it. I'm up, I'm standing up here in an upright position on Sunday morning. I'm not doing it because I do. I read this book so well. I'm standing up here for one reason and one reason on God's grace. Every single one of us who approach these 12 steps approach the 12 steps already sober. Every single one of us who approaches this deal approaches it already sober. So this didn't get me sober. What gets me God's grace? On October 11th, 1986, what happened for me is what happens for a lot of people. When desperation meets opportunity, a window of grace opens up and I jump through the window. I jumped through the window that morning. So I jumped through the window. And when I jumped through the window, what I've been doing ever since then, the book talks about enlarging and perfecting my spiritual life through self-sacrifice and working with others. So ever since then, I've been bigger and better in my spiritual life. Bigger and better. Enlarged and perfect. How do I do that? Grow God's shrink growls. Grow God. 
shrink route. How do I get this growing God thing going? Shrink me. Don't worry about growing God. You just shrink you. He'll be what's left. Reduce you because you in the way. I mean, my sponsor says that is him. Don't worry about that. Don't go looking out here and go looking out there. Well, how do I do that? Just work for his kid. You know anybody? Sometimes people will say, well, I love God. I love this power. And I, you know, it's a lot of people that love Alcoholics Anonymous can't stand alcoholics. <laughs> The theory of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, the organization Alcoholics Anonymous. It would be great if it wasn't for those goddamn alcoholics, you know. And some folks, and you know, I had some people, and and, and well intentioned and well meaning. Some people came up to me talking about Ralph. We want to start a ten, eleven, and twelve. Wouldn't it be great to be in a meeting where everybody is all the way? Rec- and it, and to me, this is me. I'm a trenches guy. It's like that sounded to me, Jimmy, something like being in a hospital with nothing but doctors. What is that about? <laughs> We want to keep the riffraff out. We are the riffraff. What the hell are you talking about? Well-intentioned, well-meaning, I understand that. But the deal is, you know, the deal is what it is that we do. The reason we came out here this morning is not to dazzle you with information, not to dazzle you with uh, what we can say from this podium, not to dazzle you with our vocabulary, not to dazzle you with our knowledge of this process and the rest of this. The reason that we came out here, Flora, is to let you know that there is a way out and a way up. The reason I came out here for you is to let you know that there's a man that came up in here that was a shell of a person. You know, I come up in here not to talk to you about that. You know, somewhere inside there's probably a woman waiting to bust out. Somewhere inside some man up in here there is a father waiting to show up. Somewhere inside every man and woman in here there's probably a family waiting to be reunited. Somewhere up in it. That's why I'm here. That's why, I mean, I don't play with people. I don't trip off all that. You know, in the chapter, working with others, you know, it's some clear cut through. And the thing about the working with others, you know, yeah, that's the, the, the 12th step is really that piece right there. You know, having had a spiritual awakening is some stuff I can do. But I don't get the spiritual awakening if I don't start working with others before I get to the 12th step. So working with others is a continual thing. You'll see that very early in our literature. Our constant, you know, my very life as an ex-problem drinker depends on my constant thought of others and how I can meet their needs. You know, I will, if the alcoholic doesn't enlarge and perfect his spiritual life, how? Through self-sacrifice and working with others. He won't be able to survive the certain, anybody in here hit a low spot? Don't know about you. The certain trials and low spots. I loved when Gary was sitting up here talking. I loved when he was talking about, because he's iconic in my mind. I've heard about him for a long time. And he walks on the, you know, the alcoholic spiritual waters as far as I'm concerned. And he was st- and he just a guy. He just a guy. He said, I've been taking people through. I was doing the damn thing. I was sponsoring. I was sponsoring people who were sponsors to people. And I was doing the damn thing. And I went bankrupt. And I was doing this on my way. And I was doing. And he's just a man standing up here doing the best he can with what he got. And he was standing up here talking. And the reason why that resonates with a guy like me is because that's what I do. I fall down. When I take one, I can't tell you the amount I'm going to take. I can't control it. And when I sincerely don't want to put it in me again and start that cycle up again, I do it again anyway. And I believe that probably makes me alcoholic. And if that's the case, I'm suffering from an illness that only a spiritual experience conquer. And I don't believe that because it's written in there. When we were, when, when, when the men and women that I work with and that I, and I, and I trudge with, I don't, you know, I'm right there. I don't just take this. Okay, so what? It's in the book. And do I believe only a spiritual experience? No. Why do I believe only a spiritual experience to conquer what I suffer from? Because I tried a financial experience. Didn't work. I tried a love experience. Didn't work. Tried a family experience. Didn't work. Tried a father experience. Didn't work. Tried a fear experience. Didn't work. Tried a self-knowledge experience. Didn't work. Tried an acupuncture experience. Didn't work. Tried an est experience. Didn't work. You know, I tried everything there was to do. That's why I believe if that if that last one, you know, if it ain't, you know, suffering from an illness that only a spiritual experience to conquer. And you know, and, and that, and I'm being 
all over our material. Somebody said, you can't talk about one step without talking about the others, and particularly this working with others, because this is how I, I got there for me, and the way that they work with me, because that was a hard pill, because I grew up in the church. And, and what it was, you know, I always felt like, this is miss. I'm not feeling it. You know, and maybe I come from a Baptist church that, you know, sometimes they feel the fit what they feel, and I'm, I'm, I'm a skeptic. If it ain't my experience, you're lying about it being yours. That's the kind of guy. <laughs> you phony. You fake it. I still say that sometime in recovery. I have to really be careful on the, some of the old ideas that I have. If it's not my experience, you're lying about it being yours. And so in church, people would, it's a trip because my brother talks a lot too. Me and Ronnie slept in the same, we're a year apart. Three months apart recovery. He's three months ahead of me. He's a year younger than me. We literally slept in the same bed, could smell each other's feet. We, they, you know, we literally slept, same house, same conditions. Emerge out of that house with two different perspectives of it. Ronnie always wanted to be somebody else, wanted to be something else. He always wanted to feel what my mother felt in church and felt like it was unavailable to him. I never wanted to. And I look at my mom in church because one of them, and I don't know about a lot of you guys, you may not know, but in Baptist churches, sometimes folk, you know, get overcome with it. And I look at my mom like, you better not jump up in here and embarrass me. <laughs> I'm a kid. I'm a kid. <laughs> You don't know about that, Carl, because the Lutheran churches, they're probably, they're probably, thank the Lord. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> that ain't where I come from. No, you know. And I look at my mom like, don't you embarrass me. I'm seven. Selfish and self-centered at the, from earlier. I'm so selfish. I don't know where we're going this morning. Stay with me, though. I'm so selfish and self-centered. I'm so selfish and self-centered. This is Ralph White. Through eight years old, 109th Street Elementary School, I remember I'd be walking through the hallway, and I'd walk a certain way because maybe I'm on candid camera. Oh, people remember candid camera? I would really be rehearsing. For real, okay? For real. I'd be thinking one day I'm going to be on candid camera, and I needed to be walking right in that early age. Early age, you know, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm that kind of guy. So the, this whole church thing, you know, I'm not feeling that, you know. So when we hit the chapter, we agnostics, you know, and some working definitions for that agnosticism for me was, you know, you know, and yeah, I didn't have a problem because I wasn't trying to be an atheist. That's too windy an argument you got to uphold. Why there is no, uh, plus I, I suspect that there was. He just wasn't doing nothing for me. Plus I wasn't trying to fool with him. You know, that, that's, that's the bottom line. So when presented with this idea, that only a spiritual experience can conquer this. You know, I really identify, you know, when the book said that next piece, which seems really, really odd. To be doomed to die an alcoholic death, which ain't pretty, is slow death. Death on the installment plan. You know, it's the kind of death that they looking at you again. You're doing that kind of, you know, cutting it slow. To be doomed to die an alcoholic death or to live life on a spiritual basis is not always easy. Death, life. Why ain't that easy alternatives? Death, alcoholic death, or life. Because they put that other piece on the life in. Or to live life on a spiritual bed. Why you gotta go there? <laughs> or to live life on a spiritual are not always easy alternatives. When are alternatives not easy? Ralph, kid. You can have castor oil or cod liver oil. Yeah, great, right. Electric chair, gas chamber. You'd rather be shot or you'd rather be cut. You want to listen to Liberace or Lawrence Well? God damn, you know. <laughs> Alternatives are not easy when they look the same or they appear equally distasteful. And the live life on a spiritual basis, or alcoholic, they look the same. Ain't that, ain't you, what? Ain't living life on a spiritual basis the same? And I'm thinking that because I know, I don't know what a spiritual basis looks like, and I think I do. I think spiritual basis mean no fun, no chasing, no, you know, no, 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 none of the stuff I like to do. So number one, I don't want it. And here's the kicker. 
Not only don't I want it, I can't do it no way. Plus, I can't live up to that. I'm not that guy. That's beyond me. And in that chapter, you know, which they talked about already so masterfully, I won't go back through it too long, you know, but in there, I did the negative second step, which is what brought me into this piece. I had come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of living life as I have been living. I had come to believe that at three in the morning, you'll find me walking. And it's just going to be like that. I had come to believe. We don't know what's waiting on you in recovery floor, but I can guarantee you what's waiting on you in the life. That's how I work with new people. I had a guy that came to me, one of my favorite guys. He said, Ralph, I've been in 17 programs. Called me at 3 in the morning. Went and picked him up off the street. He had on a T-shirt and tennis shoes. L.A., and it was cold for us. He had frozen out here. It was the middle of the winter. And I picked Ray up. He said, Ralph, how you going to guarantee? I said, what you want to do, man? He said, I want to do whatever you tell me to do. All right, we're going to get you somewhere in the morning. I don't want to go nowhere again. How you going to guarantee me what's going to happen? I've been in 17 programs before. I said, I can't guarantee you what's going to happen if you try it this way. I can't guarantee you what's going to happen if you don't. Sponsors, don't be sitting up here browbeating people. You don't sell a program of Alcoholics Anonymous. We ain't trying to stop people from drinking. In my home group, we say, we want you when alcohol is stupid. Alcohol is our salesman. That's our sales. That, that, that's our account exec. We don't have to go out looking for no, alcohol is our AE. You know, okay, you want to keep doing Okay, you like it, I love it. You know, they'll be back. That's just like, you know, Fred talked about Who was talking about Fred? Was it uh, Jimmy? You know, Fred, okay, see y'all. And they's like, okay, cool, Fred, you will. And Fred was like, we didn't hear from Fred for a while, but that's how that happens. That's how that works. You know, and we get the opportunity. We get the opportunity. We get the privilege. I've been going a lot, and people be like, Ralph, ain't you inconvenienced? And don't it feel written? I like having an immune system. When Gary was talking, he said something in his talk. He said, through all them years of all my malfeasance and alcoholics, and I, personal, personal, personal stuff that was going on, that was going against what it was that he was the man he was growing into. He said, but one of the things that must have held me in all that time, he said, I never stopped working with others. I never stopped working with others. I heard. I heard. I never stopped working with others. It's a privilege we get to do that not a lot of people get to do. Working with others encompasses sometimes sponsorship. It encompasses more than sponsorship. It encompasses other than sponsorship. And then come, but that is the greatest privilege I get the opportunity to do. And one of the reasons why you never hear Ralph White talk about I throw people where you you, you ain't got to do you know the, and and you hear me talk sometimes I feel like I'm fun okay I am you know you hear me talk a lot about my sponsor and and most of it is his example. And Bob talks about, we know who the players are. You know, I got people on my tip. You know, I got people on my tip. You say, how many people you sponsor? And I don't know if it's Scott Lee who has that answer, but I don't know who it is. But the first time I heard it, I loved it. How many people do you sponsor? Oh, about half of them. <laughs> Isn't that a great answer, sponsor? About half of them. Why folk be going around firing people? Check this out. The reason most people fire sponsees is so sponsees ain't doing what they want them to do. Well, the ones who ain't doing what you want them to do ain't fooling with you no way. It ain't like they're taking up a lot of time. You know, I'm not even tripping off that. You know, I don't even, because, because we don't work with others to get them sober. We work with others so we stay sober. What the hell am I doing getting rid of my immune system? No, you're, no, 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 no. You know, I need you. I need you. In the early ones, when they were doing 12 step and real stuff, and, and a lot of times, folk of our generation, when Clancy was talking, a lot of what he was saying, I was like, oh man, that ain't what we do now. But then I'm like, because this is how I am. This is how I am. 
I will hear Gary Brown. I will hear Bob Bazanz. I will hear Clancy. And they'll talk about really what happened. And they hear. And I want a discount. Oh, you ain't doing it right. How the hell am I going to tell you you ain't doing it And you're sitting here. You're sitting here. I used to be in a spot and somebody used to be telling me, you ain't doing it right. I'd be like, I do. I pay for this shit. I do it however I want to. I'm getting the effect. I don't care what it looked like to you. I'm getting the effect. You know, Charlie, because I did something, everything. Charlie was really nice and dancing. He said, you know, we're not going to talk about it. You know, I, I did a lot of stuff. I grew up in, you know, I came up when I came up. You know, when they handed me that J, if I had known I'd be here at the Gotham City Roundup, when they told what you know, back in like 72, when they handed me the joint, I would have probably told them, Mark, I can't hit this because I'm going to be at Gotham, but I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't know. So... <laughs> and new friends the tradition violation ain't mentioning that but the tradition violation is talking about that and you ain't and ain't talking about alcohol that's what we do we alcohol it's anonymous you know and, and so in working with others you know my sponsor I was on the part and he like we know who the players are we know who the players are. Me and Jimmy was talking, you know, uh, last night, you know, and, uh, no, me and Charlie were talking about that last night. I don't trip off guys. I got people, you know, and sometimes I listen to Kate, I listen to Charlie, I listen to Mike. You know, I listen to get, and I'd be like, Steve, something's wrong with my sponsorship. You know, you guys just seem like you sponsor so much better. I listen to you when you share. And it's like, so new friends, don't trip off that. That is, that's who we are. That's the humanness in us. I don't know if it's the alcoholic in us. That's the humanness in us. You know, that whole comparing and I want to be like this. And, and, you know, sometimes that is also, it could be motivational. Look for the similarities. Don't look for the differences and don't trip off that. I'll never be able to get up there and talk like these guys have been talking this weekend. Don't worry about that. This ain't a talking program. It's a living program. It's within the grass reach of anybody sitting in the room right now. You know, so my sponsor talks about we know who the players are. We know who the players are. Don't be worried about the people that ain't doing the right. You know that ain't. Because it's enough people that's hungry for what it is you have. And you're the only one that's qualified to carry your message. One of the biggest benefits and one of the biggest things I've been given in Alcoholics Anonymous is my own walk. You will hear people who talk about us being a cult and us being, you know, being in the end. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. Always been scared of what you would think of me if I really showed up. I've always been scared that you would toss me if you knew who I really was. I've always been afraid of, of, of who it is. I don't know if Katie said it, but it is so, they, they give voice so much better than me sometimes to what it is that I feel. Most of what it is that we share in these rooms, when you find yourself not, it's not new information. It's not information, it's confirmation. It just confirms something and somebody gives it a name. They put words to something that I've been feeling. I couldn't put it in those words. And so we nod and we, and we identify. Had a brother in my home group, brother named Brother, and he used to say, when heart speaks, heart hears. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, that's what we do. We speak the language of the heart and we do it the way nobody else can do it. We can reach other people when nobody else can reach them. We charge with that. There's something that is special about what we do. And the way that most of us get it, the thing that we are armed with that makes us the most useful and the most valuable, it hurts a lot, but it's what we are armed with. And it's our experience. I got on my knees in my first year of recovery and I with a group of men and women and I said, God, I offer myself to you to do something with me. I offer myself to you. And if I'd have said that prayer, if I'd have said that, if I'd have walked up to you, Miss Soon, with that one year of recovery, and I wasn't a vision for you, I wasn't much to look at, and I didn't have nothing going on. I was standing at my mama's house. You know, and if I'd have walked up to you and said, Miss Soon, I offer myself to you, you'd have been like, dude, keep it moving. You know, but, um, <laughs> but what I like about this process is when I did that sincerely on my knees in front of this power, I didn't know. On the, th that's the third step. I didn't know this power. 
was a promise to submit to the rest of the process. And I got on my knees with a group of men and women, and I said, I offer myself, do something with me. And I've done a lot of things in alcoholics, and I've veered left a lot of times. I've fallen down, and I've done stuff. I've done stuff I'm embarrassed by, and I've done stuff that I'm ashamed of. I've done stuff all, you know, and then at the end of the day, those are the things that seem to make me the most useful. But what happened when I got on my knees in that condition? You know, in churches, in religious institutions, I don't know if they say that. It's what I heard. You had to come a certain way already. You had to come right already. And I thought it's anonymous. You don't have to come right to get right. Come like that. Get on your knees, third step. Steve was talking about it felt hypocritical. That's the biggest freedom in that third step. Come as you are, still hoeing, get on your knees. Still lying, get on your knees. Still tripping, get on your knees. Still watching porn, get on your knees. Still not being able to be trusted, get on your knees. Still not giving them a full day's work, just get on your knees. And right in that condition, doing those things at that time, in that circumstance, he'll do what it is that he do. And he don't need your permission, he does need your cooperation. And he did something with this man's life. He did something. He did something. He did something. It's what we do better than anybody else. At the end of that prayer, it says, God, take away my difficulties. Not because I'm afraid of them. I am. Not because they're uncomfortable. They are. Not because I don't want them. I don't. But take away my difficulties. The victory over them may bear witness to those I would help. That's how we get most useful, you know. So if you're going to claim that God can handle anything, check this out. Sometime he just going to have something for you. going to have something for him to handle. Somebody in here just have something for him to handle. Don't trip. Somebody in here feel like they're in a dark place right now. Don't trip. It's going to be what you are. But I'm going to tell you, you can grow in the valley. Been there. You can grow in the valley. You can grow wherever you plan. Not only can you grow, you can thrive and you can prosper. 22 years sober, I thought that they needed a treatment for the, I thought they needed a recovery home for old timers. I was like, Carl, you got a, I was ready to call you. I felt fraudulent in my, in my sponsorship. I felt like I didn't need to be going out talking no more. I didn't know. You know, I thought that there was this, this, that there's going to be this, um, causal relationship. And there is somewhat between if that that is a measure of how you doing the damn thing. The measure of how you doing the damn thing is doing the damn thing. Remember about how it looks. You know where we come from? Who we and it takes sometimes it takes a while. That's why my sponsor my son, he said, should it might take fifty. Cause I fall down. Spiritual walk ain't perfect. But I love this thing because as a result of me falling down, I am extremely useful to folk because that's what we bring to the table. Everybody in here got something. You might think because you can't take people through this. You, don't have, you got experience. You got experience. I can stand up in front of you and say it with certainty. You can lose your house and you ain't got a drink. I can say it with certainty. You can come out of a 20-year relationship in front of everybody in your Alcoholics Anonymous community, knowing everybody at the same moment, you ain't got a dream. I can say it with certainty. IRS can come after you for 80, you ain't got a dream. You can say it with certainty. You can go broke, and you can live happy, joyous, and free in Alcoholics Anonymous. I can say it with certainty. You can come through the dark and you can get to the light and I can guarantee you that there is light. And here's something else I can guarantee you. That if you put your hand in this hand, those promises they read, if you keep working with us, if you stay close to us, if you keep doing this damn thing. I remember I was getting ready to talk. Stay not. Getting ready to talk on the third side about making this decision for God. I was upstairs in my room and I got a call from my wife. They just came to the door and put a note on the door. We got to be out of the house. I'm losing my house, and I'm getting ready to go downstairs and talk. It's December. I got two girls, and my girls are spoiled because of you guys. They're spoiled. Yeah, Christmas is a big deal in the White House. Big deal. My girls don't know that. That Christmas is looking really bleak and really bad. My feet have been trained by you guys. 
I, I didn't, you know, when, the thing about doing these things right here, folk, don't come up here rehearsed and practice. Come up here and shoot from here. That's why we, you don't know where it's going to go, you know. And I'm, I'm up there talking about the Thursday, and stuff comes out because that's what I'm trained to do. I had a friend that said, Ralph, when you think you're looking bad, that's when you're looking good. And me, I'm an image guy. I have to counteract that. A lot of people say, Ralph, we thank you for your honesty and your humility. No, that's not who I am. So I practice diligently to be transparent. I practice diligently to let God use me. You know, I practice diligently to do that. And I'm standing there and I'm sharing and it comes out and we don't know what Christmas is going to look. And my fellowship showed up. I'm not one that ever diminishes the power of any one of those sides of the triangle. I don't diminish the power of Alcoholics Anonymous. You guys have carried me. You've carried me at various times. You know, and so this deal, this working with others deal, it yields benefits. And the benefits it yields, you usually see after the fact. In that process, this, this, this reduction of ego, this ego reducing things so that the power can grow in my life. So that I can experience this transformational power that's done the impossible in this man's life. Next Saturday, I'll be getting on a plane. I've got two little girls that are no longer little girls. My ba- my ba- my oldest one is 31. She's a practicing attorney, and she gave me my first grandson. He's three months old. <laughs> Thanks to you guys. He'll always have a granddaddy who's present and accountable and spoiling that young man. My little girl, she's 19, will be on a plane to Boston next week. She'll be moving into her first apartment. Dad will be flying back with her because that's what daddies do as a result of alcoholics and alcoholics. This working with others deal, man, is real. It's tangible. It'll take you to the next level. Three levels of prayer life, three levels of my spiritual life, and I'll call it synonymous. First level, first phase, almost all of us come in here on that. Help me. First prayer, universal, almost all of us come in here on that. Next phase, phase two, give me, grant me. Third phase, highest phase, highest calling now, call it synonymous. I can lose my money, check, lose my house, check. You know, lose, you know, my standing, I thought, I didn't, but in my mind, all that. Third phase, highest phase, can't take it from me. Use me. Use me. You've made me useful. You've given me a way out. You've given me something to hold on to. I am extremely, extreme. You never hear Ralph White say, I don't know why I'm sober. I know exactly why I'm sober. I get a blessing so that I can be a blessing. And recovery for me is a gift from God. What I do with my recovery, that's my gift to God. My name is Ralph. I am an alcoholic. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.